Yeah. Well, good evening. Welcome to Pelican Rapids and welcome to our community informational meeting regarding our city dam. Uh, there are some handouts on the table when you came in. If you don't have one, uh, please get one of those. And if you haven't signed in, please do that also. We want to thank uh, Lake Region Electric for allowing us to use this meeting room this evening for this important me meeting. And I uh, want to thank Mr. Kerry Haug, who is here with Pelican Rapids High School, who is going to be filming uh, our meeting to be shown on Channel 2 at uh, later dates uh, from our big cable television services. A few introductions. Uh, we have uh, council here this evening, Kevin Ballard. If you want to, when I call your name, do you want to stand and so everybody knows who you are? Kevin Ballard, uh, Steve Foster, Kurt Markgraf, and Steve Strand. Also, our city administrator, Don Solga. Engineer uh, Rick St. Germain from Houston Engineering. Rick? Yeah, okay. Uh, DNR staff, Luther Odlin, Amanda Hillman, Julie Odlin, Amy Childress, Howard Fuller. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, our former mayor, Wayne Runnig, in here this evening, too. He may have to step out at this time. And also our uh, Outer Tail County Commissioner, Mr. Wayne Johnson. Did I miss anyone? Any elected officials? Well, this is our second public information meeting. You recall we had one on the 30th of January, 2018, over a year ago. We had one scheduled for the 30th of January, 2019, but due to uh, uh, cold weather, that meeting was canceled. And the weather almost canceled this one by the looks of it this morning, but we were able to, to pull through. Our only topic for discussion this evening will be uh, our, our city dam. There will be no, no decisions made at this meeting. There will be a time of questions and answers uh, from to the DNR staff or uh, city uh, officials uh, later on. I asked that if when the, you have a question, if you would please stand and state your name and your question and uh, for respect for others, if we do not speak over anyone else and state your question plainly. If you were here on the 30th of uh, January 2018 meeting, you know uh, there was many good questions and great conversation that came forth that evening. And our focus this evening is to gather information from the DNR, whereas the city council can make a a decision on either to repair the dam or to replace it with a river, Rock Rapids. You're aware that our dam is on the DNR hazardous uh, list, and this does not imply that the dam is going to collapse in the immediate future, but in the immediate future, we're, if we're going to keep the dam, we would have to repair it. The dam was last repaired in the late 1980s, approximately 30 years ago, and it's estimated that if we repaired it again at this time in 30 more years, we'd probably have to, to uh, repair it once again. So it, it is a, a maintenance item. If the dam is to be repaired, uh, we're looking in the neighborhood of a million dollar cost, which would be borne by the taxpayers in the city of Pelican Rapids, uh, residents and businesses up and down the street. If the dam is removed, there will be a rock rapids built and the cost would be paid for by the taxpayers of Minnesota. Approximately two years ago, you probably witnessed the, the collapse of a portion of the wall, the facade at the dam, and it's still that way at this point. Uh, that was due to erosion. It, didn't, it did not uh, jeopardize the integrity of the structure of the dam. It was a decision was made by the city council at that time as we did not know if we were going to repair the dam or replace it just to pull that off until we decide what we are going to do at this point. The DNR has removed several dams in the state of Minnesota and replaced them with rock rapids and they'll explain later uh, the process and tell the benefits of future fish, uh, mussel and aquatic life migration when the dams are removed. In 2018, the Fish Lake Dam was uh, 
removed and replaced with the rock rapids and within a short period of time uh, many uh, walleyes were seen schooling within the area of the rock rapids and at this time i believe prairie lake and lizzie lake associations have wrote letters of support to remove their dams and replace them with rock rapids we don't know do not know the dam as we witness today is not is it's not of natural design it was built in the 18 60s to 1870s for private enterprise to produce electricity for a flour and lumber mill. The Rock Rapids has been viewed as for economic development, possibly canoeing, kayaking, fishing, and to draw other water enthusiasts to our community. Water levels upstream could be attained to the similar levels they are today through the designed engineering. Also, talk has surfaced with working uh, with the DNR to put a path from our current mill pond all the way up to Prairie Lake. If a rock rapids were installed, we would view a totally new look in the downtown Pelican Rapids area. We still would re have our Pelican statue, the windmill building, and the rotary suspension bridge. If the dam were to be repaired, it would be not much of a different. Uh, structure than it is today again we as a city council are here this evening as you are to uh, gather the, the facts to come to a decision as to either repair the dam or replace it with the rock rapids we value each and every one of you your questions your opinions and we'll certainly weigh them as we come to a, a decision on what we are going to do here in pelican rapids regarding our dam at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Don Sogler, City of Pelican Rapids Administrator, as he is going to go over some information. Some of this we covered in our meeting over a year ago, and some of it is new at this point. Don? Thank you, Mayor, and thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, because of the weather, we were kind of questioning whether we should do it or not, so I'm glad we did because it's, it's difficult to schedule things with uh, the number of DNR individuals who would like to get up here, uh, everybody, elected officials, uh, you know, their businesses and schedules and everything else too. So it's good that we can still do this tonight. My purpose tonight is really just to go through a presentation, and it's really the one that I did a year ago in January of 2018 with a, maybe a couple tweaks, but this being one of them, we didn't have that lower rendition of what it possibly could look like a year ago. But, um, so I'm, I'm gonna go over the same information. The reason I'm doing it again is because some of you maybe weren't here a year ago. So it'll be new information for you. The rest of you guys, it'll just be a refresher. So again, this first slide is just a, a is, maybe what could be. Again, the mayor kind of went over the agenda. I'm gonna go over uh, the study options and I'm, I'm gonna kind of go through it rather quickly. Uh, I think the main thing we want to get to as soon as we can is just to hear from the DNR um, and, and their river restoration options or ideas. And again, the mayor talked about this. We're talking about the Pelican Rapids Dam only. It's informational, just to get more information out to everybody in the community. We did three studies on this dam, and the timing of the studies was driven by what was going on at the dam. So the first study we did was a wall study, and that was a result of the collapse of that that, uh, that rock fascia. And the mayor had talked about or mentioned that that was just due to erosion and water getting trapped behind it. And when that dam was put together, there was really no um, design or mechanisms in there to hold it should water get behind there, freeze thaw, that type of thing. The second study um, was after we drew that mill pond down, so that we could do some analysis of the dam wall, uh, and we saw the condition of the spillway, we decided we need to do a study or have a study done to look at the condition of that spillway also. And then as we were taking the water down, we ended up having some issues that maybe, maybe many of you are aware of, where because of the amount of water we were sending through that old windmill, there was some washouts on the side which caused a, a, a part of the, the uh, ground on the outside on the south side of it to collapse and a little bit on the north side too so we wanted to find out what was going on with the power house so that is the three studies we ended up doing again this is just a picture of that collapse of the of the masonry wall uh, again i had mentioned there was no system in place to hold it there over the years 
Um, so we looked at, at two alternatives to <coughs> repair the, uh, the dam masonry wall or the dam wall in particular, or in general. The first one was uh, a gravity block wall and the second option was a riprap extension. So the first option is gravity block wall uh, really is, is replacing this whole rock wall where that rock block base is right now and then doing some restoration, replacing fencing and all that stuff around there. So this is the first option, this whole stuff here for a, a wall of the dam gets reworked but the main thing that we're focusing on is replacing that, that block wall. So that's alternative one. Estimated cost to do that, $638,000 a year ago. The second option was then just to rip wrap it, you know, clean uh, this whole wall out of here and then just put a bunch of rip wrap in extending out from um, the, the downstream side of the, the main uh, dam wall and then just kind of extending out, leaving Pelican Pete, leaving the mill, uh, the, uh, the chutes and the, the windmill in place. Cost of that was estimated, alternate number two was 429,500. So then we took a look at the spillway when we drew the water down and you can kind of see from these photos uh, just the condition of it. The concrete was deteriorating. We've got rebar that's starting to, to kind of show itself on the sides. <coughs> And so the options of, of, of repairing this talked about a repair option first, and then also we looked at a replacement option. The repair option was basically to remove both these wing walls, replace a 19 foot section of the main structure of the, of the uh, spillway, um, and then repair the remaining concrete. The engineer estimates that a service life in this type of repair uh, uh, would be about 20 years. And then we'd be looking at doing something again. The replacement option was basically to tear out this whole, the spillway completely. Uh, draw the wire down, tear it all out, rebuild it. Um, and that would give us a service life of 75 years before we potentially would have to do something again. Estimated cost to do the repair option, 214,000. Um, the replacement option, about 365,000. And then <clears throat> also replacing the gates. The gates also were done, I believe, back in the 1980s. And the city basically controls the amount of water flowing over the spillway by um, a, a gate mechanism that just uses a kind of a ratchet system and a chain. So the guys would go up there when the water level in the mill pond gets to a certain high, a certain uh, level, and we and you know we're, we're concerned about the amount of water back pressure or pressure on their gates, and and we were able to release some water down. We'll go up and ratchet them things down, which allows more water over and we try and control it, keeping a certain level on the downstream side, taking into account we've got business buildings you know, downstream of the dam too. We don't want to get the water levels down too high there or too high there. So um, you know, that's how we control them. Well, those, those, those gates are really worn, kind of an old way of doing it. And so we want to look at the different types of gate systems that we could do that make it a lot easier for us uh, and that might uh, um, be a better gate system than we, than we had in place in the 80s. They estimated that the gate systems could range anywhere from 20,000 to 138,000, depending on what type of gates we do. And then the, the windmill or powerhouse, uh, when we started sending water through there, we ended up washing out down in this area, and that's kind of right, come, the water comes out through here. So this pipe right here is kind of inside the, inside the powerhouse. That all washed out. We had a washout through the side, which you can see right here, and that's what caused that, that collapse of that, that, that ground on the outside of the wall. And so we were looking at an option of possibly repairing that, uh, ten dollars to $15,000 to basically fill this area with concrete to the best that we could to shore it up so that if we ever have to run water through there like that again, We'd be pretty confident that we wouldn't have to worry about washouts. So when you summarize all this and put it all together, depending on which option we go with um, on the uh, repair of the wall, the spillway, and the gates, you're looking at 673 to 1.15 million dollars. Now these were cost estimates that were obviously one year ago, or probably a little bit further back than that when the studies were all were actually done. 
but uh, we'd have to take a look at you know present day what them options would possibly cost us now. We did get uh, this. We had asked the state once before to for some funding help with the dam, and so what they did, I think it was two years ago now, in the bonding bill, they actually put five hundred thousand dollars for engineering purposes of the Pelican Rapids Dam. And so we we used a little bit of that with these studies because of the, the engineering activities that were done. So going forward, we're not sure without doing some checking, you know, how much of this would be available if we decide to remove the dam. This was just for engineering dollars for um, the repairs to the dam walls. Uh, one of the things about this five hundred dollars too. With all of state grant money, you think grant, we get five hundred thousand dollars. We only it's a dollar for dollar match. So the only way Pelican Rapids would get five hundred thousand dollars the way the, the legislation is written now, we get five hundred thousand if we spend five hundred thousand. So for every dollar we spend, they give us a dollar. So we know that if we decide to fix this dam, the engineering activities aren't going to cost a million dollars. And that's what it would have to be for us to basically get the whole five hundred thousand from the state. So there's some questions on that we have that we would need to start asking too. Um, you know, how could this $500,000 possibly still be utilized by the city of Pelican Rapids if we decided to uh, take the dam out? So then I put this together a year ago. The numbers really probably haven't changed too much at this point because there wasn't a whole lot of difference in our levies the last couple of years. But this is kind of an impact, a tax impact based on your marketable tax value if we had to bond for a $1.2 million bond at a 20-year term. So you can kind of see what your estimated property value might be and then look at the number. Here's commercial down here. This is all residential property. You kind of get an idea for 20 years, this is what your property taxes would have to do um, or your portion of it if we decided to repair it down. And then all this information is on the city's website. You can go to it anytime you want to. If you go to the main page of the website, on this side it says dam studies and information, and then there's all these PDFs. That all three of the studies are up here. Uh, the, the DNR's presentation in January of 2018 is on up here. Uh, the, the, the presentation that they did to the city council in November of 2018 is up here, and uh, actually, I believe it's the same presentation that they're going to be going over tonight. If not, we'll get a copy of that from them, and we'll also get that up here. And then the things that I've just talked about and went over tonight here, too, is also on there. So go through this stuff, read through it, and then after you've done that, the most important thing is to let your elect elected officials know what you think. What, what is your opinion of this? So any questions on that? Susan Hartstein. Um, so are you saying that the people that make the decision are the elected officials? This, the Pelican Rapids Dam is owned by the city of Pelican Rapids. So it is the elected officials that are ultimately going to be deciding on whether the dam stays or goes. Yes. With as much help as we can get from the state if we decide to fix it. But that's, you know, we know that we've got 500,000 for engineering purposes, but that's just for engineering. Can we use any of that for actual repairs? We don't know that at this point. That's not the way the legislation is written. Anymore. Yes? John Wayne Johnson, I'm just curious. Um, did the grant come through the DNR's office on the dam engineering, or did that come from a different department? And maybe that question is better directed at the DNR side. No, it was not DNR. It was not DNR. No, it was part, it was part of the capital investment. Okay. Of the state itself. So okay. it's on the bonding bill. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jim Johnson, this might be getting ahead, but I understand that we would have to, as a city, apply for Lassard money if we went forward with either the, the grip or triple uh, rapids thing or dam repair. That's a question for the DNR. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and we can definitely, when he's um, going through his presentation or don't his presentation, definitely make sure you get an answer to that too for clarification on how that all works. 
Anything else? Well, with that, I'm going to basically have Luther come up and we'll swap out these uh, PowerPoints and then we can take it from there. Okay, um, so about a year ago, I guess we, we uh, talked about uh, in more detail about some of these things. I'm going to um, not go through that whole talk again because <laughs> it was really lengthy, um, and, and you do have access it on the city site. But uh, uh, just to, to revisit the issue, so I, I uh, um, and uh, some of the others, uh, Amanda Hillman, uh, worked through. Uh, uh, handling uh, state funds for river restoration. So um, uh, Don talked about options for funding a, a dam replacement. The Outdoor Heritage, Heritage Fund funds uh, river restoration projects. And uh, the funding is based to provide habitat, and, um, clean water, those sorts of things. So um, that is scrutinized by the council. To, to make sure their money is going towards uh, uh, good purposes. We rank projects uh, for the council uh, to, to also assure that we're investing well. So, um, but uh, what I'm gonna do is just a quick overview of, of some of the reasons why um, uh, doing things with dams is something that uh, is, is uh, funded by outdoor her heritage. Luther, would you like to boost yourself, please? <laughs> you know, I, my name is Luther Odlin, and uh, um, my background is in uh, river, river ecology and fisheries, uh, fluid morphology, kind of everything having to do with rivers. I'm a river scientist for the DNR, and uh, I've uh, actually did most, both my master's and PhD studying uh, reservoirs, including the largest reservoir in the United States. and. Uh, um, uh, river ecology and that kind of thing. So I, I've been involved in uh, just river restoration projects uh, of all different types, but uh, dam related uh, projects in particular, I think well over a hundred uh, uh, dam projects, not only around Minnesota, but around, around the country. So, did I miss anything? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Jumping the gun here. Okay, so this issue of aging dams is, is a, a national issue. Um, the Association of Civil Engineers uh, estimated take about $45 billion to just bring all the, the old uh, high hazard dams, just the high hazard dams, up to uh, uh, shape. So it's a big investment for uh, all different units of government in dealing with the core on projects where they're now going through uh, what they call disposition studies, where they want to get rid of some of their dams because they're very costly to maintain. So, uh, as mentioned, the, the Bellcraft exam is a high hazard dam. And what high hazard means is probable loss of life if a dam were to fail. And the last uh, inspection was uh, considered in poor condition. So, so that's uh, one of the issues, and it's not uh, like I say, it's, it's an issue for many communities around the country. I am a particularly sensitive to this uh, because these are all dam failures, just some of the dam failures 
that I've been pulled into to restore the river after failures. It's a lot better to be proactive on these things and, and deal with these issues before this kind of thing happens. But a lot of these dams are actually in, in good shape um, based on dam inspections. Um, there are a lot of different uh, environmental effects uh, to dams, any economic ones, um, uh, sedimentation, we show one reservoir, there was 60 feet of accumulated sediment, but the blocking fish migrations is a, a big uh, issue. Um, and it's, uh, you have a town named Pelican Rapids, you kind of wonder where the rapids are, and this is uh, real common. Um, dams are built uh, uh, frequently at rapids because they could build higher dams and uh, get more power when they were uh, built for power. The uh, problem for uh, fish communities in, in uh, river systems is that many of these species uh, spawn in rapids. Uh, walleyes, for instance, uh, some 85% of the walleyes we catch spawn naturally. They're, uh, ha only 15% are estimated to be raised in hatcheries. So, um, but for many of our species, they, they spawn in these rapids. Uh, sturgeon, uh, in particular, one that is specialized. I, I thought I'd throw this in. This, this is work I did uh, in 1990. Um, we we're studying sturgeon spawning habitat. This is one of those, those rivers where sturgeon spawn. It's called Dead Man's Rapids. And uh, I have a, a big sturgeon there that's spawning right in there as, as swimming amongst these uh, spawning sturgeon, which is an interesting experience. We're, we're uh, taking eggs at this point um, for experimentally raising them at the DL uh, hatchery. Uh, so uh, with, with the reintroduction of sturgeon to the Red River Basin in mind. Um, the history of of sturgeon in the area, you have to go back a ways, but this is an excerpt uh, from the Daily Journal talking about uh, um, sturgeons of almost unbelievable size and were often hooked or speared from the Outer Tail River and Pelican River between 1874 and 1909. Um, talks about 128 pounder that was caught right about where this boat was. Um, and uh, a 75 pounder uh, caught here at Elizabeth um, back in 1877. Some of these fish, uh, most of them would have been spawned before the dams were built, when those rapids were still there uh, for spawning. And uh, um, I think this one's been well, well known in the area. Uh, the 102 pound sturgeon, that was the last of the sturgeon from the Red River Basin before they're entirely wiped out uh, from the Red River um, watershed. So that, that sturgeon is in pretty rough shape, but we got a new one now, <laughs> I guess. So, but it, it uh, gives some perspective for the, the history of the area and, and the, the, the sturgeon that lived here. Um, I uh, analyzed dams around the state. One of the reasons the uh, dam related project ranks so high is because they have a watershed scale effect on a river system. So on average, over 40% of the species are lost at the first dam on a river. And, and additional ones as go upstream. The interesting thing is it's uh, kind of the really unique species, the big ones and, and a lot of our shiners that are especially sensitive, the ones that are not sensitive to dams are fish like carp that are, are, tend to be the tolerant species that, that you have left over. So we have a lot of these rivers that have shifted from these really diverse uh, communities to, to ones that are pretty simple. Um, so for the Pelican Rapids Dam, there's uh, 11 uh, Pelican River uh, species that are not found above uh, the, the Elizabeth and Pelican Rapids dams. And uh, as a result, uh, the Pollution Control Agency does what's called an index of biotic integrity. And um, for that measure, so that's a measure of diversity of fish, uh, the, the uh, um, Pelican is impaired, meaning it's not 
it's a measure of water quality too because that diversity of the fish assemblage is an indicator of water quality. But it's interesting that the highest score in the Pelican River is below Elizabeth. The highest score in the entire Red River Basin is below, below Orwell Dam. So you can kind of see why the importance of reconnecting this uh, river system uh, exists because uh, we're really impairing our, our river systems as we fragment them. These are uh, some of the fish species that are missing. Uh, lake sturgeon uh, were extirpated but have been reintroduced. But that's uh, the whole goal of that reintroduction is get, to get towards a self-sustaining population of, of fish. So uh, this is just a profile of the pelican. You can see Elizabeth Dam. This is one that uh, also has structural issues. Um, some 30 years ago, our dam safety engineer called me and said, what do we do about this? It's, it's uh, privately owned. And we, we have had conversations with that individual, but it, it has been, there have been concerns about its uh, failure. Uh, I think just about every flood, flood that I, I can remember on the, the Pelican Endurance, uh, often concerned about that one. Um, as we go up, you can see uh, this is Shornham Dam um, by Sally. Um, Fish Lake that we just did this past year already had uh, walleye spawning in it and passing through it. Dunlocks we, we did in 2001. And uh, now, as mentioned, Prairie Lake and Lizzie Lake are on the docket to be converted to rapids. One of the other things this, this profile shows is these steeper gradient spots that existed where the dams are that were really what we call critical habitats for a lot of these fish that spawn in, in the rapids. Okay, uh, oh, this is just a little, little one from Fish Lake here. That was the dam beforehand. This is the, the rapids that we built. And uh, these are suckers now spawning in the rapids, but we had, had walleyes in there just prior um, this. So it, it both allows fish passage and also creates some habitat. The uh, original survey for uh, Pelican Rapids, uh, for the Pelican River, where Pelican Rapids is now, shows the rapids marked on the map. So they had to be a pretty prominent feature for the surveyors to do that. And uh, during the drawdown, we were able to paddle through it, and those rapids were already becoming exposed. And uh, as some of you noticed, the, the uh, substrates already went from silt in the reservoir to start scouring clean to sand and gravel, and uh, changing really quickly, even though it's really low flows. So um, parts of the channel were really skinny because they're associated with the low flows. So that would widen and change over time. Now back to the concept. So uh, what, what this would illustrate would be uh, a, a rapids that we've, we've built at different sites. Uh, the maximum slope on these is about a 3% slope to assure that you have fish passage and that kind of thing. So this would be a, a five foot high rapid. So this would be not, not to, the, what, to the full pool now. This would be five foot high rather than 14 feet high as uh, shown in the dam. And the reason for that is we just don't have room to even go any higher uh, than that. But also, in terms of a funding mechanism, we've dealt with other communities uh, around the state with what kind of projects the Outdoor Heritage uh, Council will fund. And they don't want to just be replacing dams that still have a risk of failure um, with rapids when there's, there's uh, better alternatives. So this is uh, um, what the alignment, now uh, Houston Rick's crew uh, uh, flew the area with, uh, during the drawdown with the drone, got some neat images. So that, this is what this is based on. Um, if you drew it down, that's the route that the channel took. Now if, if uh, the river over time would, would widen, and I've, I've shown it wider than what was, was cut here because that's what it'll do. It'll, it'll kind of match the natural river widths of the, the, the unimpounded Pelican River. 
But these are where we saw those historic rapids become exposed when we paddled it. And you can see some of those on the LIDAR images too. Um, with the five foot rapids, we would still have a pool in this lower part. And uh, um, I threw in, now this is just a concept. If, if the city were to decide they wanted to go this direction, you'd have to go through engineering and, and we'd, we'd uh, refine all this and, and uh, um, work with engineering to, uh, to come up with, with some of the details. So this is just initial uh, concept of what it might be like. We were talking before the meeting, you know, that these areas back here might have been places where there were historic meanders. Um, Pre-dam, you don't know if they, how, um, when the river would have been like that. Just a quick question, yeah. those dark blue areas there, what do they imply? That just, just suggests yeah. where the pools would naturally form. So pools, those meanders are real important because the outsides of the meanders uh, are where the deeper water forms. And, and when we've done this in other projects, we've had uh, some of those pools get quite deep in, in, um, in, uh, up to 10 feet deep um, in, in, in those outside bends. So even though the water level is uh, lower, the river has its processes back that scour those habitats and form the river. Let's see. Um, any other questions on just the, the layout of that? Like I say, this is an initial cut. Um, and it's the easiest one because this is what the river started to form right away during the drawdown. Now it, it would continue to form itself and, and uh, for that to happen. Yeah. Does the core have any input on uh, this? Um, maybe Julie can. No, the river it. starts with Detroit Lakes, right? It, it does, but it acts the upstream of Detroit Lakes. Right. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm from the state, not the federal government, so I can't really answer, but they potentially would have some permitting authority over the project. I don't think they would have any influence on design. Julie's the area hydrologist. She's also my wife, so I go to her for questions on these things. <laughs> Yeah, and we've worked with the core on different projects. Um, we got some photos, I think, one we did on the reservation where the core was the primary permitting authority because we don't have jurisdiction on reservations. So. so they control the river flow? No. The, or does the state DNR? Well, the, the, no one really controls the flow. That's how much rain falls. You know, there are, there are dams that regulate flow upstream of here. They, they, there's, there's dams, but they're just fixed dams. Right. So Washington, now, Washington. You know, like Orwell, Orwell is one right. where the core does open gates during the flood. And, yeah, or are you familiar with like, like uh, Osterman's dam on here? Yeah. And would that still be controlled? <laughs> that, what's proposed there is, is that the dam really stays in place. It'd just be sloping it with the rapids like we did at Fish Lake. So it would still maintain the same water level. There wouldn't be any change that way. Anything else? Yeah. I'm just curious, um, as the water goes back into its original um, flow bed or whatever you call it, what happens to that land? Is, is it a marsh area? Yeah, you know, it kind of depends on the area, but, but um, I'll, sh I'll show you an example of that. Um, normally, um, you can see areas upstream of there where it is marshy. Um, what happens a lot of times in reservoirs is the reservoir accumulates some sediment. And then as we, we uh, lower the water level, the river cuts back through that. So those ov overbank uh, areas will often turn into a floodplain forest, like it might have been there historically. So I think for most of the reservoir, that would be more, but there'd be parts of it that might be more well too. It, so it'd still be a beneficial area in case more water was flowing through. Yeah, 
Exactly. So it's floodplain that, that stores water, and floodplains are really important for doing that. Um, I just was going to walk through some of the questions right away that came up at the last meeting that uh, Amanda presented at. And uh, one of the questions was just on the walk bridge. Um, what's the difference? Um, Amanda surveyed that, and, and uh, it's six feet currently to ice level. And uh, with the concept we've shown, it would be it'd drop, it'd be dropped about nine feet, so it'd be about 15 feet. Um, will the sediment smell bad? <laughs> and if you're around during the drawdown, you notice there, it, it's kind of stinky because you have all this organic matter that's exposed. And uh, um, having done a lot of these projects, uh, this is a short term thing um, because you're, you're initially, you got all this saturated sediment that starts drying out um, and within um, a matter of, of uh, weeks to months that, that uh, odor goes away. It's, it, what it is, it's, it's hydrogen sulfide just released from decaying organic matter. As the soils dewater, they firm up, start growing vegetation, and then that, that odor goes away. And um, these reservoir sediments tend to be very fertile, so things grow very fast. Um, another question, was that a fish weight considered? Yes, uh, um, we went through uh, different, different possibilities with Houston when, uh, a few years ago. Uh, the, the trouble with full pool is that it is 14 feet high and that fishway to pass fish would have to be about 500 feet almost 500 feet long so just finding the real estate to put a 500 foot long fishway would would be a challenge and the other issue with that would be uh well first of all would we be able to get funding it went rank as high with outdoor Her heritage council um they they don't like to fund uh, um, things that don't restore that habitat, um, even though the fish passage is a real important part of it. Um, and so, and it wouldn't address the dam safety issues, which is kind of the advantage of the concept, getting away from having to spend a million bucks every uh, 20, 30 years or, or whatever. Um, can the edge of water be mowed? That was another question. And, uh, uh, yeah, the answer is legally yes, but it's a bad idea. <laughs> it, uh, um, turf grass, the, the grass you have on your lawn has roots about this deep. Uh, native plants, uh, native grasses, native wildflowers, and, and trees can have depths that are, are 10 to 30 feet deep. So it's much better for holding the bank. Um, people that have mowed river banks are people that tend to lose land because the river erodes uh, quickly in those areas. So I'll, I'll show you an example of um, communities where they've, they've, you know, had lawn away from the river, and then they've had trails uh, through the woods and trying to create a neat, uh, neat area. So there's a lot of options for that. Um, let's see. With the, oh, there's a, a wetland uh, to the south. Uh, I think, I'm not sure who asked this question, but there's an off-channel um, pond, and there's concerns about that. That's something that could be um, uh, determined by putting a gauge in there and doing a drawdown. And, and we actually did that in, uh, in the city of Laverne with the dam removal. They had city wells they were concerned about, so we actually did drawdowns to, to see what that relationship was. Um, just for to answer the earlier question about what the land is a common interest, this is uh, the project we just uh, did in, in Orinoco near Rochester on the Zumbro River. And uh, the interesting thing about this one is I uh, visited with the county who owned the dam um, in, what was that, 2000, uh, well, uh, it's about 2000, 11 or something like that. What's 2009. that? 2009. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, they were considering removal at that time. Yeah, and uh, because a very old dam filled with sediment. And uh, the following year, there was a 500 year flood. And the dam failed and took up this uh, kind of iconic bridge. It's a big arch bridge, which was the main artery in the town. And uh, so then uh, we, uh, at that point, uh, the, the community moved to remove the dam. These are rapids that we, we built, kind of similar. This is a, a lot bigger. This is a, a 20 foot high dam and it had 18 foot deep of accumulated sediment. So this is about a 600 foot long rapids that's about six feet of fall. Um, this is just a landowner's property that I visited with. He has little walnut trees coming up that he's proud of. And uh, But this was where the reservoir shoreline would have been. He's already um, got a mowed lawn. He's not right at the water's edge, but he's already uh, got a nice lawn there. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, this is just during the dry down. You saw that narrow channel uh, during very low flows. Let's see. Just a couple examples. This is one up uh, on uh, near Red Lake. Um, way up here, this is on the, the, the uh, Red Lake Reservation. And this was a, a, a similar size, this is a 15 foot high dam. And uh, it, it apparently filled with sediment. It had, in this case, had arsenic contaminated sediment. So we worked with the tribe and the Corps and uh, EPA actually funded this. But we built uh, rapids similar to what we're proposing here. And this is also, this had a lot more stinky sediments than <laughs> what the, this uh, reservoir did, it does. But uh, by the ne next spring, it was already uh, uh, growing grass and, and uh, really pretty uh, aesthetic uh, spot. And we had fish spawning in the, in the rapids. Uh, this Appleton, this is, uh, again, this one that filled with sediment. And, Another one where the city voted to remove the dam, and then we got the 97 flood and it failed. So we re restored the river. And these, this, this was uh, all just nasty sediment. Um, as you can see here, it, it, it had failed, so it drawn down a little bit, but uh, now it's 30, 40 foot tall trees. And what the city did there was, uh, was put in trails. So this is just dam woods here, got a little rapids here, and, and some other riffles that we put in. But they put in a frisbee golf course and some things like that. But that's where the trail goes. So that's where the reservoir would have been. So let's see. That's just another image of the one at, by Rochester. This is actually me paddling through the, the rapids there. And we made a, you can see it's a wider, uh, pretty wide rapids, but we have a lower thalweg so you can uh, paddle through that without getting hung up on the rocks. And uh, um, what was kind of cool was the gas station in town painted a mural of the restored river um, uh, shortly after we did the project. So any other, I, I think, uh, that's enough. <laughs> but if we, we had the question on land ownership. Uh, any other questions on any of, of this? You yeah. talk, you talk, I think one of the articles I've seen, you talked about some potential areas that you were going to possibly dredge out. Yeah. Areas. Yeah, and, and this again was just a concept, but one of my thoughts uh, in, in uh, proposing that part of it um, was this this area here um, there's landowners along this this bay and uh, we're, we're doing a project that I have to go to at six in the morning down to <laughs> southern Minnesota and where we, we actually excavated uh, wetlands off channel and this would be kind of following a similar concept where we, we create a backwater 
so that people would have access to the river. This, this was an area where, this is actually where I got out of my kayak, and that's a lot of accumulated muck there. So we had, had uh, thought maybe that'd be a place where you'd, you'd uh, pull that back a little bit to widen the pool a little bit. The nice thing with backwaters is that they don't tend to fill with sediment like a, a reservoir does, because they're offline, so the sediment kind of blows right by them. Um, the one we're doing in, in uh, Blue Mountain State Park will have a series of off-channel wetlands. That has a very, it's ag agricultural land, very high sediment load. But these off-channel wetlands will, um, when the flood water comes into the flood plain, those sediments drop out. So the water in those off-channel wetlands will stay pretty clear. And we've, we've in, in that case, they've got endangered fish species. They use those, those off-channel uh, wetlands. So um, any other questions on this? Uh, I did, did I answer what you, yeah, yeah. Oh, was somebody angry? No. Uh, so can you? Uh, you know, we have a businessman in town that started a kayaking business. And uh, anyway, he's, uh, he's been pretty favorable as, to, you know, using the river. And uh, the way it's going to be set up now, it's going to be controlled where? Well, yeah, so again, it wouldn't be controlled, the water wouldn't be controlled, it's just what the watershed, you know, if it's a dry year, yeah, no it's right. not going to be so good, if it's a wet like year. It's being controlled where, at the beginning, or? Uh, so the, the water level control, yeah, yeah, so these rapids actually are controls, so they, they kept keep the water, river from cutting down further. So those would all fix the water level above them. Now, one of the things that we have some bathymetry, but the exact <laughs> slope needs to be profiled in more detail here, um, because this part of the reservoir, the water level is gonna be higher than down closer to the dam. So, but the rapids would control this pool level. And, and uh, again, so we'd be, It'd be a five foot high rapids. Um, so that, that, that would maintain that pool, but the, the river itself would, like I say, when we paddled it, it was low flows, and and we were able to paddle through in our kayaks. So the first place you control it is Bucks Mills? Uh, Bucks Mills is just a fixed crest dam, so that doesn't control the amount of water. So the, 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 that's gonna be the answer. The river is, is, is Run of, the, run of the river, so it, it flows, if it's, if it's high water, or you higher water, it's higher water, when it's lower water, there's no one up above the, the, in the watershed controlling a gate or anything like that. Yeah, so, neither the otter tail, the otter tail doesn't have any control dams except for Orwell. The, the hydro dams are, are even run of the river. Now there's, they, they keep a kind of pool, so they don't increase the amount of water or decrease it. Uh, under normal circumstances. Yeah. Luke, this might be a question for Houston. So you're replacing an 11 foot high, the, the concept is to replace 11 foot high hazard with five feet up rock arch rapids. Where's the other six feet? Is it further upstream in multiple or does the river naturally do that on its own? Well, for the kind of, understand yeah, my, right, understand my question? Right. So, at up here, the water level would be the about the same. Okay. You're, you're, the rest of that fall is through the rapids. Do uh, you want to add anything, Rick? No. Yeah. So, so a reservoir, you know, is like a wedge. Yeah. So it gets shallower and shallower as you go upstream. So the the biggest change would be near the dam, and then it would be less as you go. So on any given day, the water above, basically where Gordon's Turkey, where that last rock, where that last yeah, there is that we see right there, really wouldn't change. Not much. Um, when we paddled it, you, it was it was really a good time to paddle it because you could see where the water level was and where and and when we we got up in that area towards the edge of the slide, there's very slight um, difference. In, Thank you. 
The city of Pelican Rapids has a clean debris out of that dam all the time in the spring of the year. My question is, after you fix these, who's going to clean the debris, or is there debris in the rapids above that? There's yeah. going to be debris, but who's going to clean it? Yeah, for where we've done this, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a stick that'll catch just, you know, as it would on any riffle or rapids. So, so yeah, you can get uh, debris, you get next high water and it floats off. Um, the ones, for instance, on the Red River will accumulate quite a bit of debris certain times of year and the next event carries it off. And so it's, it's a, um, not really necessary to, to deal with that. But yeah, there'll be some, in this case, probably not a huge amount of wood, it'd be more bulrushes and stuff like that that would catch and then high water floats off. Um, the, the difference with some of the, well like Hoffman Dam is one that's, or Hostman Dam is one that has a history of accumulating bogs and that kind of thing. Um, it's a little more of a conscription and, and, and uh, um, with a lot of bog right upstream. Here, as we drop this, one of the things that, that creates that, uh, reservoirs are, are uh, especially any kind of fluctuation in reservoir, during high water will float that off. And, and in a river, those things will um, probably shift more from you know, cattail to, to trees along the river where it, it tends to stay put. But you're gonna have some of it. It's, it's just a matter of whether you wanna deal with it or not. Not, not an issue where it would be a problem here. Are there going to be future costs of maintenance in the rapids, or will they last forever? Or? Yeah, um, for the most part, um, we've had a number of these have 500 year floods, and of them had record uh, floods uh, pass over them without any maintenance issues. We have one in Duluth that went through the 500 year flood that actually failed the the Thompson four bay, uh, the dam, I think I showed that one. The rapids was there, didn't have any, any issues. So the, the only issue, maintenance issues would be if there's something during construction that maybe wasn't quite done right, or you can go back and, and fix it. For this, since the Pelican doesn't have the really extreme events, um, I think that would be, um, be, be very low maintenance. I assume you own it then. No, no, no. The, the city would continue to own and it'd be, it'd be the city's project. Everything that you've talked about has been from the dam downstream. What's the effect on upstream and what's our guarantees that we'll say Prairie Lake doesn't turn back into a pasture? Well, Prairie Lake, uh, here, I'll, I'll go back to the profile for Prairie Lake is actually, you can see the approximate water level here. The river actually, there, there's both a dam controlling that outlet. That, the proposal is to, to leave that dam in place and build rapids below it so a fish can get over it and people can paddle over it, that kind of thing. So there'd be no change for Pelican Lake. The, even if the dam weren't there, the riverbed itself uh, historically controlled the lake level for, for uh, Prairie Lake. Anybody else? So what guarantees do we have that Prairie Lake will maintain its water level? Well, uh, again, nothing, nothing changes at Prairie Lake in terms of the outlet. There are no guarantees that we don't have an extended drought that lowers Prairie Lake. A good, a good example would be the Fish Lake outlet dam. I mean, if, if you just going through that process right there, just knowing the, the property owners that are on Fish Lake and Big Pelican Lake and everything else, when we went through that process, again, the dam itself stayed in place. Everything under that water, the concrete is still there. The dam is really still there, and you, you build that rock or the rock rapids below it. I guarantee you that if water levels are going to change there, we're going to hear it. But the, the Pelican, the Pelican Rapids Dam has no effect on Prairie Lake. Correct. So, that's so the simple answer here. The seawall that's at the bridge at the outlet of Prairie Lake, that has a break in it right now. Yeah. Is, is, 
Is that going to be wrapped across? Yeah, so that's yeah, that's the plan. So that would be a rapids, and even if the dam dissolved, the rapids would still control the lake level. We've got several like that where the dam was removed and, and uh, completely replaced just with the rapids and still maintains the same water level. And the other thing on Prairie Lake is the south end where the public access is. It keeps getting silted in from the river. Will we get a cut through there so that in the fall of the year we can get our boats to the public access? Yeah, that, that'd be an entirely different issue, but uh, that probably would be something that'd be funded through Lassard because that's kind of a, a natural issue in, in lakes and on river systems. Yeah, Lou, you had it. Just more of a curiosity, but why was it? Why was there arsenic in such heavy? Uh, you know, heavy yeah, water? and it's a pristine water. It's actually a natural source there. Um, part of that project was replacing the bridge and DOT for anything they moved or excavated, they had to haul to a certified spot. To, um, it, yeah, it's kind of an odd thing, but uh, apparently there's high arsenic just naturally in the soils there. We don't tend to have a lot of problems. We typically test these sediments. Um, I've never had one where we had uh, contamination issues now I've, I've uh, helped uh, uh, a project uh, that uh, helped uh, Ontario near Niagara Falls on the Welland River and they had a long industrial history where they were dumping all sorts of nasty stuff so they had some nasty contaminants. We're pretty lucky in Minnesota that we, um, at least in this area, where we don't have a lot of that. I know uh, replacing the dam was going to cost the city X amount of dollars. If they went with the rapid system, is there still one kind of cost with the city still be incurring with that? I'll let, uh, let Amanda speak to that since so she's the head honcho. Hi, um, my name is Amanda Hillman and I am the restoration coordinator with the River Ecology Unit, so I do our funding submissions to the Lazard Council. Um, so we don't have a required match for our funding, so we can fully cover um, engineering and construction of these things. Um, and, and if we get the project done within a certain window, we can cover any you know, uh, adjustments that we need to be done shortly after construction as part of the construction. So in a short, we can fully cover the project. If, you know, obviously, we still have to go through submission to the Lassard Council they have to make a recommendation and then the legislature has to approve that recommendation. And um, I guess while I'm talking, I might as well just say that right now we do we are doing a request for projects. And it is a lengthy process, so um, I think the latest we could get a submission from the city would be May of this year. And then it has to go through the processes of DNR process, the SARD council process and legislature. So that money wouldn't be available till um, July 1st of 2020, so it's something that there is a lag time on funding, so it's something to think about. So when you talk about funding or covering the cost of the project, and that's removal of the dam, so then we've got areas that we're talking about excavation possibly at, at Bay and, and other areas, that would be considered part of the project? Yeah, I mean, there's habitat value to that, so that's something we can include. Trails? Uh, no trails, no bridges. Those are things that are going to have to be covered. How bad do you want to remove <laughs> <laughs> If you want to go down and testify, I'll <laughs> well, we, Don just mentioned bridge. Now, we've had a walkway across the river at the dam. And if you're not covering that, that's going to be a big issue in town. It's a lot that, cheaper than a million dollars, right? Well, I feel you know, that. <laughs> it seems to me that that's almost a necessity. Yeah, well, you know. um, and yeah, good luck with that. With <laughs> Sorry. But, um, you know, the, the, we had a similar one at Dunlocks. It was when we removed that and replaced it with rapids. Um, you know, that 
the nice thing with the Pelican is it doesn't have the extreme floods, so I, there are more options for the, those kinds of that width of span bridge. We've got one down in Blue Mountains, that's one of our dams, um, State Park that I'm going to tomorrow. That one is going to have a bridge built for the same reason for what the trail. For? That, that, uh, yes, it, well, that one is funny because that was a, a FEMA disaster. It was, they had an extreme flood event, so it's actually federal dollars um, paid for that. But it was damaged, flood damage is, is different than, than the, the Lazari part of that. What's that? We've got bird houses. There's going to be some special bird houses. I think Yeah, I'd say you have to be creative about how you handle that. Um, when we removed the Breckenridge Dam, they they actually used a condemned. It was is it wasn't. Totally condemned. It was an old bridge that was historic, if I remember right, and it couldn't carry uh, current, you know, modern traffic anymore. It, but it, they used it for a bike trail, and they were able to <laughs> take that historic bridge and plop it in, and uh, were able to do it, do things uh, uh, pretty affordably that way. But, so there's there's some options, but yeah, um, the side won't, won't play pay for that kind of infrastructure. How about the so, dams at Earhart and Elizabeth? Are they going to stay in place or? Uh, just a quick um, add on to that. Um, the statute says that Lissard money has to be spent to enhance, protect, or restore habitat for wildlife. So that's, you um, can't really justify bridges that. So. Um, yeah, um, Elizabeth certainly <coughs> won that. Something's going to have to happen there. Um, yeah. Okay, how about Um, what do we have at Earhart? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, there's no, there, yeah, yeah, there's no dam at, at old Earhart that I want. Um, now, even in, one thing I thought about in town here, uh, you have a little block bridge downstream that has an old sill. I don't know what was there. That's a kind of a velocity barrier that could be rolled into the same thing, and it, it, uh, it's something that where you could uh, make that more fish friendly and, and really uh, more aesthetic too, with a ripple instead of a concrete sill. But yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just curious. Kind of hidden. What will it look like during the construction process of this? Will we have not hardly any river? Will we? There's going to be a messy part of it. <laughs> There's no getting away. <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, I guess an example of what we usually do on these types of projects is winter construction. And the advantage is you got frozen ground, you can run the machinery on, you don't disturb things as much, lower flows. So um, it's usually when people are less active on the river, anyhow. But so yeah, there'd be um, it, it's a, it varies, but it's usually a, a few months of construction on something like this. And when are they tearing up Main Street? Are they doing something? 2024. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're looking at <clears throat> we're looking at working with Mindau. We're going to start doing that this year throughout the whole uh, 2019, working towards a 2024 project that redoes all of Highway 59 and all of uh, Highway 108. And it's still yet to be determined whether we do that in one construction season, which would be very difficult, or two. But it's obviously just like every small rural community in Minnesota goes through, you saw it in Park Rapids, you see it in many other ones, where they rip up the whole Main Street. PennDOT needs to replace their, their road. We need to get to the infrastructure underneath that road. You know, was a year ago or whatever it was when we had that intersection that cost the city just that one main break cost us hundred and forty thousand dollars so we need to get to the infrastructure it should have been done probably 15 years ago when Mendon was working on highway 59 so that's a 2024 project and you'll be hearing a lot more about that throughout this whole year
I've got a question about uh, acquired land by the private property owners along the river. To the river when it subsides, they acquired new land. What about the river bottoms up there? Does DNR help reclaim some of that to natural property? Oh, no, the, the river bottom. The, the restoration parts of it are, are things that that military her heritage calls can be for. Yeah, yeah. So, so things like uh, um, plantings, you know, trees, tree planting, um, uh, bank stabilization, um, in, in, in uh, projects build riffles, you know, that tend to have deep pools associated with them as part of the river restoration. So there would be uh, the things that would be desirable from a habitat perspective and restore it. What, what, the real goal is to restore the self-sustaining river that doesn't cost anybody anymore. It just takes care, care of itself. Um, so, but but for those to, to get there, are um, you know the parts that the river can't do on itself or, or would be slow to do, that they'll be you know rolled into the project. Uh, you got a question? Mike? We just went through an extremely cold period, and the river with the dam never froze or we never had any ice problems. If we do this restoration to rapids and we have a cold snap like this, will we have ice problems or anything? Or will there still be enough flow through that thing so she won't be freezing up? Yeah, so so the river flow would, would be uh, similar. Um, I mean, that's not gonna change. But the, the frazzle ice issue that occurred so that was in the 80s, uh, Right, but, um, we had about uh, 2010 Burgess Falls, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you can get, now I live downstream of Reservoir and I get frazzled ice every year. Yeah, and uh, um, part of it, when you get a, a dam throwing out water into the air when it's 20 below zero, that water super cools. And then it, it, when it's super cooled, it starts sticking to things. Yeah, and that's what it does on the river. I, uh, I live on the Otter Tail as well. But the, 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 the issue that happened um, back when the river was drawn down with some dam work, I think what happened there was that it was low flows to begin with and the river was dry um, and, and the river bed became super cool. So then when the water was released, especially over a spillway, it's especially prone to anchor ice, which creates those issues. So. Um, Rivers that just flow on their own uh, don't tend to have as much of that uh, problem where, where you get spillways that create this super cooling. Um, it's more of an issue. But, um, the year that that happened, there, was, there were no restrictions. The dam was being reconstructed that year. So it was a natural flow through, it wasn't through the spillway, it, it came through that white But building. was it during the refill that? Uh, no, or? it was during the winter because okay. they didn't finish the construction project yeah. in the fall. So they had to let it free flow through that building um, through the winter before they finished the project and filled up the, the pond again, so. Um, I thought it was a read some of the files about that. The flows became very low during that process. It could have been low, but and the water was, temperatures yeah. changed from Prairie Lake down to downstream, yeah. and that's in one of Lou's articles in the yeah. paper. But I had another question, too, about the powerhouse building. Was that going to be going away along with this project? Is that, it, it, that as far as I know, it be really serves no purpose? Because it's part of the dam now, but it doesn't need to be if the dam is gone. That's a good question, Wayne. And I guess, you know, when we've talked about stuff at this point, it's always been, you know, the, the, the powerhouse and the Pelican don't have to go anywhere. But if it's a decision, you know, to be made and, and it is made that the powerhouse go away, yeah, you're right. There's no reason to keep it other than storing park stuff in, I guess. <laughs> Uh, getting back to the question of regarding the frazzle lights, that was uh, the winter of 87, 88, when uh, we were doing the 
renovation of the dam, and also that was a year of a, quite a bit of drought, and we we're also doing a wastewater treatment facility construction project. So we were holding all the wastewater up at our lagoon system, so the water wasn't discharging into the Pelican River, which helped uh, create that problem as well. So it was actually three causes there that uh, led to the frazzle ice. One question that comes up often uh, when I talk to people is why don't, why doesn't the city keep the dam and get the benefit of hydropower in there? <laughs> now that's been studied, but apparently it's not cost, it's not feasible or a return on investment. But maybe you could comment on that if it's feasible. So you can yeah, there were, a, a, you know, back in the day, in the early 1900s, there are there a number of really small hydro dams. In fact, Frazee had a hydro dam, and that would be similar size. They uh, abandoned that uh, many years ago, many years prior to removal. Even the, the uh, on the Red Lake, which is a much larger river, uh, um, there was a hydro dam upstream of Crookston, and, and the one in Crookston, were, were, they're both hydro dams. Um, they were abandoned, I think, um, in the, well, one washed out in 1950, but they were abandoned about that time. They just weren't um, uh, uh, really uh, cost effective. In Fergus Falls, where there's four hydro dams, they're 30 foot tall on a river with much larger watershed, more flow. Those, uh, um, from what I've been told from Otter Tail Power officials, are are really not something they're making money on. They're having to pay their repair on very small uh, power production compared to any kind of a modern plant. So a lot of those, 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 those really one that um, I've been involved in licensing to of, of these hydro facilities, the one big one that we have in Minnesota is the St. Louis River at Duluth, which is, is hundreds of feet of head on some of those dams. So, so, uh, um, it, it takes a pretty good hydro dam to really make it worth your while. If, if the city was looking to invest in, in some kind of infrastructure that direction would be, you'd be looking at, for, for bang for your buck, would be either wind energy or solar energy too. Um, again, a, a more renewable resource. Now let me add to that, the hydro conversation. I don't remember how many years ago, I don't know how many of you maybe know of Larry Leverson. Um, he was in Pelican Rapids before he passed away a few years ago. It was probably a couple of years after I started in 2005 for the city. And we had a conversation about hydro there. And we had an opportunity to invite, there used to be hydro there back in the day. And it was taken out when everybody was taking that stuff out and melting it down for the war effort, get the, get the metals or whatever. Well, we had an opportunity to bring the individual from Ohio that put that original hydro, that turbine in to the, to the powerhouse. He was coming up to Red Lake Falls or whatever in Minnesota. And so we invited him here and we op opened up the, the powerhouse just for the purpose of him looking at it, inspecting it to see if it was feasible to do that again. And he said, if the flows were there, that it would be feasible. The turbine itself at that point back in, you know, probably 10 years ago would have been about a half a million dollars. That was just for the turbine. And then you're looking at, getting the, the powerhouse and everything and doing the engineering and the construction, all of it. So you're probably over a million dollars, who knows, might even be two million now. So there's that, but with that, we still have a dam that needs a million and a half dollars. So there's still that, that dam that needs repair after repair after so many years. So, um, but St. Anthony Falls, down in the cities, Twin Cities, did uh, a study back in the 90s of all the, the dams in Minnesota to see if they were feasible for hydro, and Pelican was part of that. I think I've got those two studies done, and both of them studies suggested that Pelican was not a good, was not feasible, wasn't a good location for it. Uh, one of the things about Mr. Leverson was he didn't agree with that study because his argument was that study was kind of using model data, it wasn't actual data, and he had years and years of of, of uh, actual flows that he had gotten that he had recorded himself as a hydrologist over the Pelican Dam. So we met with 
I believe it was the mayor at the time, might have been um, uh, Ben Wiesner. Uh, it was Wayne. Okay, it was uh, Mr. Runningham. And myself, we had the DNR here. We had Otto Power. We had the legislatures, uh, legislators. And we talked about that. And I think uh, Otto Power also felt, and the DNR felt that it was not a good place, regardless of, of what uh, Mr. Leverson had come up with. So we did look at that. But again, it comes really, really right down to if you want to look at that option, we're still going to have a, a dam that needs a million and a half dollars or a million plus anyway. I would just add to that his concept was to run water through the turbine at night and shut the waterfalls off at night. So he called it tourist water. And all the water, to get the, the flows through, he would run all the water through the turbine at night and then um, not, not anything over the water. Yeah, when, when I first started with the department, we were modeling hydro dams like that and the, the effects that would have on the habitat because back then they literally shut the river off so you're out paddling on the river and all of a sudden <laughs> they shut the water off and uh, so um, when we went through the last round of licensing that changed so uh, uh, almost all the facilities in Minnesota are run of the river now but that is a way you can make more money on this <coughs> river is just open it up during peak demand and, and, and then shut the river out the rest of the time. It doesn't work so well for the river. Well, I like I should have been named for AZ because he's the one that started the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh -huh. that's interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, Fergus never made it to Fergus Ball, so. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have is, kind of right now for whatever control we do have at the city level to control flows downstream at high water levels. Um, you know, we, we constantly look at when the gates are down and we've got the water coming over, uh, if we've got a lot of rain and it's working its way downstream, and we see that the levels downstream of the dam are starting to rise up a little bit in relation to the bottom of our businesses, business building, you know, we'll draw the, the, the gates up a little bit to try and hold the water back and let the stuff downstream go further downstream before we go back down again. I know we don't have a whole lot of control over Mother Nature and how much downstream levels are, but we have, seem to have some now. With this in place, what are you designed for? You talk about a 500 year flood. Is this designed for that? Or, or you know, when we put them rocks in there, we take the dam out, we virtually have no control over the elevation downstream. So is there any concern with that? Or how do you make it? Well, you know, the, if <laughs> I, I look, like, I guess Orwell Dam as an example for the Otter Tail. You've got all, all these lakes in the watershed. They they uh, draw the reservoir. That's 16,000 acre feet of storage, um, total storage. They don't always use the whole amount. But these big floods, they, they run it dry, and then they, they back it up. It makes a little blip <laughs> on the hydrograph for it. And that's, you know, obviously a lot bigger dam, um, many, many, many times. But, but so, you know, it, it, to, in this kind of a, a river, the Otter Tail is the same way. You have tremendous storage in the lakes. Just a foot of fluctuation is a lot of volume of water. So, um, you know, the, the you wouldn't let it just run as as a river. Now it's yeah. And, and that's that's one of the other storage <coughs> elements. You get a big flood, you've got this reserve storage in the in the floodplain versus a, a fairly fixed pool otherwise. Some of the other projects that you've worked with, are they, I mean, is it feasible for us to go and look at in the spring here, something in, in the area that you would recommend? Yeah, yeah, um, I guess, you know, uh, there's, uh, uh, Amy has a whole site map of different projects around the state. Um, some of the nearby ones would be, um, um, where we did the restoration would be comparable, be Frazee, Appleton, um, go up to Redby, your uh, Red Lake, um, Orinoco is the one that, that's just recently done. I mean, it's, it's just 
Um, so the vegetation hasn't really established uh, like it will be. Um, they're still just getting things settled for uh, um, that area. But, but uh, I, I, one, one that you might consider would be Appleton, because that uh, gives you a little more perspective on, on what, uh, and, and you, you can see that right off of 59 there, you come into Appleton, and they've got a little park there that's at the old dam site, and you can, can uh, see what the, they've got a walk bridge over, over there, uh, right below where the dam was, and you can kind of walk there. But, but we could get, if you have interest in that kind of thing, Talk to Amy. <laughs> She's out of our office too. So. You feel confident what we're doing here? Going to be the right deal, right choice for us? I do, and in, in terms of uh, you know similar projects we've done, I, I think you have the experience. It's worked out well. That's what we want. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, every, beauty's in the eyes of the older, but. I, what I can tell you is for a lot of these projects, um, you know, Dunlocks was one of those examples where it was a very controversial project when we did it. Um, some of the strongest opponents of that project really liked it after it was done. So it's natural and, and I run across this all over the state, even around the country, where the, that uncertainty makes people uneasy about any kind of change. But uh, as, a, as a general rule, uh, people uh, seem to like it afterwards. It's, One of the big things that I think of when I, when I start thinking about this, and I was, I was kind of negative in the beginning, and I thought, you know, I don't, I don't want to see my little community change or the things that I grew up with and love. But it's reality. I'd rather see more than not enough. I, I want it to work the right way. I think everybody does. We need to make this. We need to make this the project that draws something to our community because we have a real hard time doing a lot of those other things. This would just be a great asset. Well, I'll tell you, um, someone mentioned the, the outfitter in town, and I kind of wish he was here because the project I showed you in know, Orinoco, there's an outfitter that, that has this rental right downstream of the rapids, and when we paddled through. Um, there was a series of, of uh, kayakers that came through after us, you know, so, so it, was, it, uh, it, it is a, a different, different kind of experience, but it's, it's something that, that does draw people, uh, not only for that kind of recreation, but for the aesthetics of the, the rapids that are, are restored to the community. So, you mentioned how it cleans out the river and the silt, and that one uh, diagram you had up there, the impoundment, there was still a deep pool in an area. So in the 60s, that was a swimming pond. You didn't have a swimming pool because you had a swimming pond. Was that returned to us? Could be a swimming beach with sand in terms of an attraction for the campsite in that area? Uh, I'll tell you how well, where river, how rivers work. The, when they, they have the, this meander pattern, on the, I said the pools tend to be on the outside of the bends. Mm -hmm. On the inside, so we call the point bar, that's where sand naturally tends to pop deposit. So I grew up on a creek, and that's where <laughs> I swam in the creek. And, and those areas were the sandy areas. The, the pool, you know, the, the pools tend to collect silt, especially an impounded pool. So you're going to have part of that. That's going to be a little. A little more like it is now, you know. But the, the flowing water part of it is where it gets that clean sand. The one thing you have going for you here in terms of the river is it doesn't have a high sediment load because of, of the lakes in the watershed that, that uh, intercept a lot of those fine sediments. And it's not quite as intense of egg, you know, where you got farm fields right up to the water's edge uh, so much. That, Falcon's in pretty good shape that way, so it doesn't have the, the heavy silt load that way. But, but yeah, I think uh, um, you know that that could be a, certainly a consideration about how you. Um, and, and that's that was one of my thoughts, and I've shared this with ideas for uh, Fergus Falls too. If 
we ever went towards the removal of some of those old dams. But those those meanders are where where if you had a swimming beach that was self-maintaining, those point bars are where those would be. Yeah, yeah we, you're talking about the sediment, the sediment, sediment cleaning. We've got actually a, a lot on the river right in one of those sharp bends. And just in the short period of time that the river was drawn down for your study of the dam, our whole our whole base of the river turned into just pure sand and gravel. The sediment was all gone. Just no matter what. Yeah, that didn't, didn't even have a higher flow to Oh, it, it's the original channel yeah. of the river went there, so the speed of the river actually picked up quite a bit. Yeah. Now, we live on the Otter Tail, and it's not an impounded part of the Otter Tail. Our kids and, and we swim there, <laughs> and it's clean bottom. It's it's always, uh, uh, you know, sandy, and, and uh, we have great fun swimming in the river. Um, and I kind of grew up doing that, so. So one of the things that will happen is it will make the river a lot more user friendly where people can be in it and fish in it instead of just looking at it. That, that's one thing about rivers and, and you see it even at, at Fish Lake where we did the project. Kids kids just having a ball playing in the, in the playing around the rocks, playing on the, uh, the rivers have more shoreline and, and uh, there's there's shallow areas where, where kids can can uh, pick up crayfish and stuff like that. Yeah. How do you add to that, Luther? I really want to add, uh, I heard the request that are places to visit. So first I'll introduce myself. My name is Jay Elsog. Uh, I'll probably come around as taxpayer. I'm not, I don't live in the city, but just north of here. Um, but I'm also the chairman of the uh, Pelican Group of Lakes Improvement District, the Pagola. Um, so we replaced the Fish Lake Dam in conjunction with the uh, DNR of last winter, was it, in the past spring? I brought some before and after pictures, but you had asked, you know, is there some site visits that you could do? Access to that dam is through private property, but if there's a group of citizens from Pelican Rapids that would like to visit, uh, I will make arrangements with the landowner um, before the ice is off, who knows when that'll be. But um, we could go by boat too, but that can only fit about eight or ten on, on, on the pontoon. But, um, I'd be happy to take you down there and show you. Um, some other comments that I, I wanted to share is that as we were going through this process and uh, we heard a lot of the, the same concerns. What's going to happen to, to lake levels? Um, you know, is it going to support things? Is it going to wash out? What's the maintenance? Is there long-term costs? Um, this past year, people couldn't have been happier. Uh, lake levels stayed uh, the most stable they ever have been. We had some heavy rain periods that came through. Um, people weren't adjusting their docks. If anyone's in that business, they're probably not as happy to hear that. But um, it, we really got positive results. And then Luther's last comment here was, you know, recreation. Um, and before, people didn't really know there was a dam down there. If you look back here, there's exposed rebar. So when people did visit, um, people really could risk themselves as kids were swimming and running through there. Now we have kayakers and tubers and people who are in, in the river. There's fly fishing happening down there. Uh, people are picnicking. It's really become like a destination where people want to now go down and visit. And they call it the rapids. Uh, they've dropped the moniker of the dam. And so it really has become a, a feature you know, of it. Um, so we're willing to share our experience. Uh, Dave Harstead's here with me. He's also a member on, on the board. And we wanted to help anyone who, you know, is, is trying to you know, kind of say, hey, what's really the experience? We had a very positive experience working with, with the DNR. Uh, we also used Houston Engineering. Uh, we received about $100,000 of funding from the federal government. Um, so we also had to work with reimbursements from, from the feds. But the whole process, I mean, the lake residents showed up and found that, hey, all of a sudden, uh, they had a brand new feature um, available to them uh, on the lake that they didn't know before. Uh, and the return of the fish and the aquatic life, we monitor the water quality, all those things are like absolutely true. Uh, and I'm really excited. Uh, I love to come to, to eat in Pelican Rapids. I visit, it's my gateway to Maplewood State Park. I'm a cyclist. And I would love to see like a whitewater feature in downtown Pelican Rapids where people can tube and kayak and fish and walk on trails and you know connect on the way out here. 
I mean, we're, we're inland here, and there's a great opportunity for the city to really make a marker um, for the future. So I really like the comment that you were saying is, you know, what can we do in the future? And uh, there's an old saying about, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? And that's 30 years ago, right? So you can you really benefit with it now. And I think that's really the opportunity here. When I hear 10, 20 years from now, it's going to be a million dollars or more to make a replacement after you already made a million dollar investment and it's not really drawing tourism and extra dollars and stuff for you. I think it's a tremendous opportunity uh, for you. And me and the board would be willing to you know, work with any group of citizens or, or whatever to assist you, you know, to answer questions or, or to, to help along. Is that okay? Sorry to talk for so long. <laughs> what about sediment? Like, will you clean some of that? You know, when you're yeah, that's kind of in certain areas, you know, we talked about uh, where the, the pier is, that area um, where, where it, was, it was a little more mucky, and then in the backwater there, you know, that, that would be. Otherwise, the neat thing about restoring the river, they, they, they do that. There's a cannon there from the Civil War they talked about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so nobody uh, dug it up yet? <laughs> I'd suggest to the city, they talked to Colin Peterson, we were at a meeting over at Rector, that's Minnesota, and, uh, and it was along the river uh, on both sides, and he represents the Minnesota side, and uh, to find a compromise that's going to take care of everybody, you know, uh, it gets to be a real trial of the situation. They just kind of walking around with water, you know, and, and uh, whatnot, you know, it's, well, this is going to happen here, this is going to happen there. So I would suggest to the city council to talk to Collins' office and see for funding money and whatnot and work with you guys. You know, because this is a small town and it is a tourist town in the summertime, you know. And, uh, you know, you're putting a labor on the community for this funding to get this, you know, unless the Corps of Engineers is going to pick it all up because that's all sitting down in Fergus, you know. Yeah, and again, you know, the outdoor heritage funds, it can be 100%. We have done projects that have. When I, one of the first projects I did was Midtown Dam in Fargo, Morgan, it, with the core, and uh, the core was just initially just, just the early parts of it, and then worked with the city of Fargo, and uh, there ended up being ten different units of government that contributed funding to that project. So if you have a good project, sometimes we mentioned the limitations of outdoor outdoor here uh, council uh, funds, but, but there are other. Uh, other yeah, I just wanted to mention too that we've been in contact with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're interested in they're keeping track of what's happening here. And um, you know, my experience, you know, we did one of these on Cass Lake, which is a huge lake, and you know, nobody jumped wanted to jump in, but we jumped in first, expecting to fund the whole thing, and we ended up only funding like 35 percent of it. So, like you said, it's a good project. People want to be involved. Yeah, that'd be that'd be another one that'd be kind of fun one to visit. Um, the Coots and Dam uh, on the Mississippi River there, and uh, that that was another one where we had meetings like this and concerns, you know, especially a lake as big as Cass Lake. <laughs> um, but I uh, can't say how with it now. Anything else? All right. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, before I give it back to Brent, I just wanted to ask Amanda a question. You mentioned the deadline for those SAR funds of May. Is that annually then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've got kind of that deadline we're looking at for this year. Also, we've got this $500,000 grant. We've got to figure out what we're going to do with that because the deadline for that is June 30th of 2019 also. Now, I'm not trying to say we need to rush to a decision, but there are some things that we need to do to make sure that, you know, that, that $500,000, should we decide to fix the dam, is still available after June 30th. Also, you know, uh, you know, if we know that we, if we miss a May opportunity this year, 
we got to be ready to go again next week. So the biggest thing that I can say is, you know, get a hold of your elected officials after getting this information. Talk to your elected officials because they're the ones that need to hear from you so that they can decide what they want to do. And now I'll give it back to Brent. Thank you, Don. Uh, thanks to each and every one of you for coming out this evening. There's two people I want to recognize that are court board. Amy King is here. Amy, do you want to stand up so people know who you are? And Judy Ingebrigtsen was here, but she left. Is anybody else from our court board here? Okay, if not, I want to thank Lake Region Electric uh, for this facility this evening. Uh, Carrie Houghton for filming this. It'll be shown on Channel 2. Thank the DNR and our elected officials and you, the audience, that asked wonderful questions. I thought there was great discussion this evening. Uh, like Don said, if you have questions of the City Council, please uh, present them to us. We're going to have to make a decision, not immediately, but in the very near future. So again, thank you all.